Okay, let's begin. Uh, we continue uh, Monday's uh, look at uh, Goldman Sachs and Goldman Sachs' uh, role in uh, the world of financial capitalism. Um, and as on Monday, we have my good friend Paolo Zanoni with us. Uh, he remarked after Monday's class that he didn't get a single nasty question or gesture or anything of that nature uh, here. And then he spoke to his uh, chairman, Lloyd, Lloyd Blankfein, Blankfein, who has been going around Ivy schools talking lately. And Blankfein reported uh, no hostile response at Columbia or where, where, where else did he go? Per Princeton. Yeah. So. Okay. So let's try let's try an anonymous poll here. We'll use the technology of humming. <laughs> and what I'd like you to do is, if you think that a great many people who are in responsible positions at Goldman Sachs and similar banks make more money than they really should. Don't be shy. <laughs> and those who don't think so? Okay, I read that as 65, 35 in the affirmative. Um, at any rate, the what we're going to do today is begin with uh, an informal discussion uh, looking at some of Paolo's work over the, over the years at Goldman, um, whereas last time we focused within the firm, uh, today we're going to focus on the firm as an actor in the larger world, and uh, Paolo is going to, going to uh, respond to a few questions about other endeavors, and then he is going to uh, take, the, take the mic and uh, lecture on the, the case of the huge Spanish uh, energy company uh, and the battle for control of it. And you'll see when he does that, that the activities of an investment banker are uh, pretty challenging and extremely complex. Uh, but we'll continue with, well, let's start with, do any of you own any garments from Dolce Gabbana? Do, does anybody know what it is? What, pray tell? They're a designer. Okay, they're a designer. Do they just draw things or do they make and sell things? Make and sell. Okay. And are they for the value conscious shopper? No. No. Uh, they are the inverse of Walmart. Uh, who, who's higher on the price schedule than them, Paolo? Anybody? Hermes? Hermes. Hermes may be higher, but. So it's a luxury goods company, and Paolo, who dresses well, but so far as I can tell, doesn't care a bit about luxury goods, uh, is its chairman. Um, tell us about, just in a few minutes, about what the object of your role there is and how it relates to the CEO and the strategic challenges of the company. You know, my role is... Uh, the company, Dolce Gabbana, is it's about 23, 24 years old. It was started by the two designers and by the CEO. It has grown uh, at a rate of about uh, 20, 25% per year. Right before the, right before the uh, credit crunch was uh, a comp when the multiples were about, uh, let's say, 13 to 14 times uh, EBITDA. The company was more or less worth uh, about uh, $6 billion. But the culture of the company has remained 
like the small company, the two designers started it. And so the reason why we, de we develop a friendship out of, uh, out of uh, chance, they have an excellent uh, uh, CEO. I believe it's probably in a country where uh, ladies CEOs are rather unusual, because I think she might be the only one of a company of that size. She's really formidable, one of the best CEOs I have met. And so we develop a friendship with her first and with the, and with the two designers afterward. And at one point, they thought <clears throat> that the main challenge of the company was to become more institutionalized, because if you look, especially if you look at luxury good companies, few of them are institutionalized. Because, for instance, just to take a few, Armani is not, Prada is not, Dolce Gabbana is not, Gucci is institutionalized. Help us make sure we understand what's meant by institutionalized. Institutionalized, I mean, uh, uh, companies where the, let's say, the corporate functions are very strong and companies where you have culture and processes and personalities and uh, recruitment policies and leadership selection policies that are likely to make the company successful over the long period, regardless of the influence and the survival of the founder. So the firm, its strategies, and the, and the job structure, the structure of employment responsibility, yeah. becomes permanent enough to transcend the founding group. Yes. Okay. Usually the best way, usually the best way, the best way. One of the effective way to do it, sorry, we'll go back to Monday. One of the effective way to do it is to turn it into a public liability company and have shareholders and have uh, the discipline and the function that the public market imposes on you. Just entrepreneurs sometimes don't like to do it. And so it's, uh, and so it's, it's, uh, to try to institutionalize the company in that way without turning to the public market, which is something that the two owners, they own, uh, they own 90% they own of the company. The remaining 10% is owned by a few of the senior managers in uh, the company, with a strange company. Uh, and uh, so since they don't want to access the public market, uh, making institutionalize a company with so, such strong personalities involved not only in designing the goods but in the everyday in the everyday life of the company is not easy. So they thought that I could that I could be helpful. So far we haven't done very much, but <laughs> um, anyway also, it's a lot anyway it's a lot of fun. I have to tell you it's a lot of fun. Uh, another uh, industrial sector that you've mm -hmm. had uh, very substantial experience with is cars. Mm -hmm with uh, Ford, Fiat, Volvo, and General Motors. Have I got that right? Yeah. Did I miss something? No. Nope. Uh, unless, you, unless you want to talk about trucks. You know, so. <laughs> well. <coughs> the, the, the two, you know, two sectors are, are yeah. different. But I mean, I, your tracks, in, your tracks in a, or at least you were used to have tracks in a fair number of car companies. So. Um, I actually thought, it, thought your experience with um, helping to bring General Motors and Fiat together and then helping them to separate themselves uh, was very interesting and your views about the sort of informal compact that seemed at that time to regulate the Detroit car companies and which probably wasn't a great influence on the survivability of General Motors it seemed like a very interesting topic. If you could give us a okay. few minutes on that. Uh, see, one of the one of the peculiarities of uh, of the car industry worldwide, definitely the car industry in Europe, is that it's one of the few industries that has been plagued by 
overcapacity for at least at least the last 30 years. And one of the few industries in which these overcapacity have never been taken out of the system, but in which the players have, at least until last year, or until this year, survived. Mm -hmm. And it, this is a very peculiar situation because if you look at most, if you look at most private industries in which uh, there is there is a large degree of uh, private ownership, and uh, more or less the rules of capitalism apply to at least to a large extent, you really seldom have such a high degree of overcapacity in the survival of all the players. Not only, but I'm not up to date, uh, so I, but let's say that up to five years ago, or six years ago, when I was used to be up to date, capacity had been not taken off the system, but added. There is, uh, we, will, we will have to search long and hard to find situations in which uh, uh, productive facilities have been shut down. And on the contrary, we find uh, a lot of instances in which new productive facilities <coughs> have been built, but none has been shut down. So actually, you could argue, we would have to look at the numbers, but you could argue that actually, over, uh, actually the overcapacity has grown worse. Mm -hmm. And uh, players, the players have been, uh, I mean, they are not stupid people. They are conscious of the fact that they operate in an industry which is, or which was, but which I think still is, plagued by overcapacity. And so, except for drastic reduction in the capacity of closing down factories, they have been trying to address this situation in every possible way. One of the ways, one of the most the traditional ways that have been used has been uh, uh, different types of uh, joint ventures and or mergers and acquisition. One of the, one of the actions that <coughs> was supposed to change the face of the, uh, the face of the industry was the acquisition uh, uh, of Chrysler by Dummer Benz. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that uh, the, I think that uh, the the absorption uh, didn't work well. Daimler lost a lot of money, and afterward Chrysler was sold to a private equity firm. The only case that I know of of a reasonably large of a reasonably large car company being shut down is uh, the old British Leyland. Uh, that uh, the, that was sold to a private equity firm and that took a lot. And uh, the brand, uh, the brand was uh, the brand was sold to a Chinese producer that wanted to have a European brand. Okay, and without getting down to details, well, uh, with broad so, details, the the compact that, that seemed to operate between management and uh, and labor. And, and management of one company and management of another. And government. And government. Spell that out a little bit. It was, uh, it's different in different nations, but let's say, that let's, let's be general, which is my impression in working for them was that, uh, uh, was, uh, that there, were, there were little incentive in vigorously addressing the situation with, uh, uh, with the kind of action that you would be that you would be needing, and that was because uh, uh, you know because let's take for instance let's take an adversary view of the relationship in the workplace. <coughs> let's suppose that the management would have liked to close down one fact. Uh, the degree of uh, uh, the degree of unionization, the degree of uh, uh, in the whole company, the degree of relationship in countries different from the United States between the union and the political parties, the degree of influence uh, of the new unions on government, and in addition, the degree to which the life of the company itself depends on the government. 
and uh, you have seen uh, you have seen an example in the last credit crunch, in which the purchase uh, of new cars uh, is de facto subsidized by the government. This is new in the state, but it is not is not new in Europe. It's uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's at least the third one that I see in Europe. It's not the first one. So you have this you have this uh, this very strange situation in which. Uh, the management, the union, and the government become, to some extent, dependent on each other. Mm -hmm. And the last thing they want is uh, to upset, to upset this balance. And as a result, no, no extra capacity is taken off the system. Right. Yeah. So no, no serious restructuring is being done. So the now it is. Now it is. Now it is. Now probably it is because with the use of chapter eleven. Yeah. With a huge, with a huge financial crisis and the use of Chapter 11, uh, which has allowed, I'll tell you a personal story. I worked for Fiat as a manager for about 15 years. And I worked for Goldman for about 15 years. And uh, in some, 14 and 15. In some, if there is one deal that I have tried to do three times, has been Fiat's acquisition of cars. And I failed three times. Aren't you lucky? No, I think it's. I think it's. I think it was one of the deals that makes most sense in the industry. And this time, Fiat management was successful. But why it was successful? It was successful because Chrysler was not sold by the owner. It was practically given to them by the federal government uh, right. in exchange for an industrial product, and practically debt free. So it's uh, so as you can see, the industry is changing. But again, it's changing because one of because because of Chapter 11 and because of the size of this financial crisis, the the compact between the three players has broke has broken down. It's totally broken down. Well, and same as with General Motors. And the car industry preserving these legacy firms uh, runs against the tide of creative destruction that you totally. expect in, totally. in capitalist yeah. industry. Yeah. Totally. Totally. And, uh, uh, is, and that's highlighted by the fact that if you go back to the beginning of the uh, 20th century, there were 1,200 firms making automobiles in the United States. And there obviously had to be a meltdown there because it's an industry with huge scale economies that encourages centralization. Yeah, but tell me who, is, uh, tell me who in, uh, in the United States or in France uh, has uh, restructured right. or, changed, uh, the, or changed the landscape in car making in the last 20 years. Well, with the, the exception of some Europeans and some Japanese that have started, well, that have started uh, productive procedures. The Japanese and the Koreans are enforcing some, some changes, I think. Um, at any rate, let's, uh, I'm going to get off stage and let Paolo uh, talk about an extremely complex and interesting uh, cross-border transaction which centers on Spain but involves several European countries at once. Uh, shall How do I turn it out? Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll get the PowerPoint up. How do I turn it? Well, I wish I knew. Okay. Laptop. There we go. Hit this button. Return. Return. Let me, uh, let me try to look at one case, which is actually, let's take it, let's take it one step backward. And uh, the, the case I would like to discuss is the attempt by the new management of uh, a large utility company, Enel, which is uh, uh, only electrical, but not only electrical, utility company in Italy to change the structure and the characteristics of the company totally 
and the attempt by the management over a period of six or seven years to turn a major utility company depending mostly on one single nation into a different company that uh, will diminish the risk by being present into several nations, but at the same time that will totally change the characteristic of that company. <coughs> Let me try to explain. If you take a utility, usually utility has very little risk because it lives in a regulated sector. It makes, uh, it has an agreement with a regulator that the, the utility will make, will make certain level of capital investment and uh, in exchange will uh, be able to impose on the customer some tariffs. So if you, if you, can, if you can imagine a, a utility would be a very, very safe investment for the small investor. It would be similar to a bond. You have, to do, you have to do capital investment. Those capital investments are reward, are reward through a tariff system. And if you invest in the company, it's like investing in a bond. So if you look at utility, utilities have small capital appreciation and pay high dividends. The new management of Enel, when Enel was sort of privatized, decided that they were trying to change that completely and try to make the boring utility into a company that was going to offer more growth, more risk, less dividend, and more capital appreciation. When you try to do that to, with a giant, at, at the time in which they decided to do it, I think that Enel was worth about 40 billion euros, which make it 60 billion dollars at today's exchange rate, it's, it's a major task. And uh, the way the management uh, decided to do it was through changing the product mix and getting uh, into renewable energy, but also in trying to start a policy of aggressive diversification moving into other countries. So first, they moved uh, into Eastern Europe, to some extent, and Russia. But one, one, one thing that you learn uh, when, uh, when you take the helm of a $60 billion corporation is that if you try to change the characteristic of the company by a set of small size acquisition, you run out of time. Because if you are a professional, if you have a professional management team executing, a, a, execute, making and executing a small deal takes as much time and effort and as executing a huge one. And so the, what is different is the amount of risk. But. And uh, so the management of, an a, of ANL start looking around at uh, uh, one single move that would have changed the company completely. One of, the, one of the areas in the nations where they looked at was Spain. Why it was Spain? First, Spain has a first rate, as generally as a first rate <coughs> public elite. It's usually, I would say, it's uh, it's a country where the regulatory system, especially for utilities, it's very good, it's very stable, it's well regulated. There is a, a centuries old structure of, uh, uh, of tariff uh, regulation and tariff behavior that is very good. And this has created, as you can see, in a country that is really small, reasonably small, the presence 
of uh, at least five or six utilities that are of uh, a decent size. And so there, there, was, there is room for consolidation in a market that is very attractive from the economic point of view. So obviously, the Spain was one of the first nations where the annual management looked at. Moreover, as you can see, it's true that there are six, six players, but when you go to electricity, you only have two players that are very important. Endesa and Iberdrola. So Enel, the, and the management of Enel paid very close attention to the development in the Spanish market and to opportunities opening up in the Spanish market. What happened at one point was that uh, uh, I don't know how familiar you are with Spanish as a political economic system, so let me step back for one second and give you, uh, and give you, a, and give you a few, and you can ask questions. By the way, you can interrupt me and ask questions anytime you want, because if not, this gets very boring for you and very confusing, possibly, as well. So, uh, Spanish, the Spanish political economic system from the from the political point of view, it's, uh, it's a very stable democracy where you tend to have two large parties that uh, usually occupy the government for, some, for a reasonable amount, for a reasonable amount of time, and uh, change orderly. And these, the division between the two parties, one is a conservative party, linked with, to some extent, linked with the old, uh, the old Catholic heritage of Spain. And the other is uh, a democratic socialist party, more or less linked with the socialist heritage of Spain, which is also significant. I don't know how many of you are, I suppose most of you are familiar with the Spanish Civil War of 1935-1937. And uh, at the same time, these two parties uh, live in a culture where uh, regional differences and regional cleavages are very important. These are the main characteristics of the Spain political, political system. We'll come to the economic system in a, in a while. So two large groups strongly identified with the two main traditions in the country. One is socialist and the other is Catholic and having uh, a, also living in a situation in which you have a high degree of differentiation between different regions. Everybody knows about the Basque areas, but at the same time, you also to consider that Catalonia, the area where Barcelona is, had been striving for autonomy, if not independence, for a very long time. These are the characteristics of the political economic system. As far as the model of development that Spain, has, that Spain has followed, especially in the last 20, 25 years, is a model of development that is largely biased toward uh, construction and real estate development. And so, uh, and very entrepreneurial. So you have, you have had especially in the late uh, 90s and in the early 2000s, the creation of a lot of very entrepreneurial, very aggressive, very wealthy <coughs> companies they, that, uh, uh, which line of business were mostly construction and real estate. The entrepreneurs in these companies, you, have, you say, what does it have to do with uh, utilities? And what does it to do with the opportunities open to Enel to enter into the Spanish market? It has to do that, uh, as you can see, one of the diversification policies used by these entrepreneurial companies that have made most of the money on real estate and construction was to buy stakes 
into large utility companies. Why? It's a good diversification policy. It pays stable dividends, and we saw at the beginning. And plus, you enter into an industrial sector that is fractionalized, and so assuming that there is consolidation among those seven players, you are likely to be paid a premium for the shares that you have. So what I try to do that is very complex, and so you have to excuse me and you have to ask questions, is that this is different from, this is different from the utility sector in any country that I, that I know of. You have large, or you had, large construction companies as minority but significant shareholders in many of the utilities companies in Spain. And they are there for two reasons. For three reasons. Diversification of risk, because you are in a very stable, in a very stable business, totally different from construction and real estate. You get high dividends for the state that you have bought, and so you get a good yield, a good yield on your capital. Third, there is more likely there is likely to be consolidation, and so you are likely to be paid a premium for the share that you purchase. So a very nice <coughs> A very nice position to be in, but look at this for a second. A, every company in which there is, for the same reason that I try to tell you, every utility company where there is one of these construction companies as a shareholder does not have a very solid shareholder base because one of the main shareholders is there not not because of uh, commitment to that particular industry or anything, but just for having yield while it lasts and for selling the shares at a premium when there is consolidation. So if you look from the point of view of someone that wants to enter the market, you have very attractive market because the, regula the regulatory regime is very good and you have a situation of not totally stable shareholder base in each of these companies. Exactly. So, as everybody expected, at the end of 2005, uh, the, fact that the, uh, the fact that the structure of the industry had too many players started changing. And one of the company, Gas Natural, decided to launch an hostile bid on Indesa, counting on uh, two things. Counting on the fact that uh, in Indesa, the were shareholder that have been seller for the same reason that I gave you before, and on the fact that there were uh, synergies and economies of scale and scope that could have been achieved or implemented by putting together Gas Natural and uh, Indesa. They launched your style bid, but something that they didn't count on happened immediately, which is that the reaction to that bid was not very friendly by two entities, the regulators, as you can see, the CNE, and the Spanish government. Why was not the Spanish government uh, reaction favorable? I mean, first, you have, you have a deal that makes perfect sense from the economic and financial point of view. The shareholders of Endesa are happy because they get paid a decent premium on their stock. The company remains Spanish. Synergies are going to be ex extracted. There is not a lot of overlapping, and so there are not going to be a lot of layoffs. The ensuing company will be very strong, will definitely be a national champion, probably a European champion. So why doesn't government like it? It happens to be that Endesa is Madrid-based, and Gas Natural is based in Barcelona. It also happens to be that at the same time, there is a big fight in the political arena 
between the government party, socialist, and the opposition party, the conservative. And one of the issues that they are fighting on is decentralization of power within different regions. And it also happens that while a large part of the power base of the Socialist Party is in Madrid, a reasonably large base of the power of the Conservative Party is in Barcelona. So oddly enough, or naturally enough, the ruling, the ruling Socialist Party sees the attempt by a, a gas company from Barcelona to try to buy the biggest or one of the, the second biggest, depends how you count, utility company based in Madrid as almost a political move instead of an industrial move. And they just don't like it. And so they try to stop it, as you can see from the statement. They try to stop it through making it difficult through the regulatory agency and just uh, trying to fight it with all the weapons that they have. Enel, the Italian utility company, has not been the only one looking at the Spanish market. If the Spanish market is that attractive, as I try to describe it to you, that means, either, that means that someone else, that a few other people have been looking for opportunities to enter the Spanish market and get hold of one of those crises. And one, one of the companies that have been looking for that is a German, the German giant called E.ON. E.ON is an exceedingly sophisticated company, exceedingly. They are sophisticated. They have been a leading utility for so many years. They know all the complexities of uh, operating in a regulated sector where you depend on the investment you make and the tariffs. So they are, they are very sophisticated in understanding the political environment in which you operate and which heavily influences your outcome and your choices. So they see an opening. They say, wait a second, the government doesn't like the, government doesn't like the gas natural bid. Gas natural doesn't have a lot of cash. So it will be difficult for them to raise, it will be difficult for them to raise the bid. At the same time, they don't seem to have they don't seem to have uh, political support. So maybe here there is a space for a foreign bidder that will table for the shareholders a bid that is higher than the bid of gas natural for N days. Gutsy move. Because if you look at a style bid cross border in Europe, in a regulated sector, I think this is the first one. Very gutsy move, very well structured, very well done, very well timed. So Eon moves, and as you notice, the bid is significantly higher than the previous one. 27 euros instead of 21 euros. And in a very, in a very sophisticated way, which is, which is worse of the company that Eon is, uh, they also start a sophisticated lobby with the European Commission because they believe that the main threat it is not another bidder. The main threat is the Spanish government doesn't want they doesn't want uh, a German utility on the leading champion in Madrid. There's no reason why, if they, didn't like, if they didn't like Barcelona to own it, why should they like, uh, why should they like, uh, I don't even remember where Eon is based. It's based in the Ruhr somewhere, but I don't remember. I think it's near, I think it's near Frankfurt. I think it's near Frankfurt, but. Dusseldorf. Dusseldorf, sorry, you're right. That was wrong. So, Eon starts lobbying the European Commission and hopes to have an opening by the German regulators. That opening really, no big opposition comes, but an opening really doesn't come. And the, and the Spanish government, uh, and the Spanish government stalls. 
So rightly so, Eon, believe, Eon looks at the ownership structure of Endesa and sees that there are a lot of sellers. So it says, okay, this is going to be a financial fight. Let me just up the ante. I raise my bid to 34, 34 euros per share. Significantly, significantly higher than the offer by Gas Natura. And they think that they have, and they think that they have a winning hand. In addition, they have all the resources. I think that, that I seem to remember that at that time, Eon has cash on the balance sheet for about 100 billion euros. So these peanuts are going to cost about 40, 32. Again, they don't, they don't go anywhere and they get stalled. At that point, Enel, that has been watching the situation, sees an opportunity. There is a bid by Gas Natural that, that, that doesn't seem to go anywhere because of political opposition and because it's cheap. There is a bid by the leading European champion or utility that is a lot richer and can become a lot richer, but doesn't go anywhere because the Spanish government is reluctant to sell or to have one of the one of the utilities, one of the uh, one of the national champions end up in German hands. So Enel sees an opening and a strategy based on three variables. One, they say, maybe we can pay as much as Eon. We don't have the same cash on the balance sheet, but we have no debt. So we can, we can try to fight it on debt. Second is we might be more acceptable to the Spanish government. And that's too, that needs to be found out. And the third is, and this is really, in my opinion, the winning, this is really the winning perception of Enel. They say, why should we buy off those construction companies or the biggest construction company that are, that is in the capital? That can be our ally in unlocking the situation. So why? Should we try to buy them out? Why don't we simply go and talk to the entrepreneur? This, this construction company is it's usually one entrepreneur for each company. Why don't we go and talk to the entrepreneur and see what do you want? Do you want cash? We'll give it to you. Do you want a piece of the company? We will make a deal with you. What do you want? So, Oddly, not oddly, not. naturally enough, the entrepreneur says, no, 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 says, the reason why I'm here is because I want to diversify my risk. I want uh, uh, significant opportunities to grow, to grow, and so what I really want is not cash, but is a piece of endesa. And so Enel says, okay, uh, let's discuss. Then, uh, Rationally enough, the entrepreneur, which is Akshona, stalls. So Enels try to force his hand and does something very unusual, in a very, very unusual in a cross-border takeover company, goes into the market and buys 10% of Endesa in the market, which according to Spanish which according to Spanish regulation you can do. And they, Enel has not launched a bid yet. Huh? It's someone coming out of the left field. So they go into the market and they buy 10%. At 39 euros per share. Higher than, higher than the bid for the bid by Eon. At that point, they sit around the table with the entrepreneur and say, see, we are very serious. So. We are either going, either we are going to buy this company, or Eon is going to buy it, or we make a deal and uh, together we buy it. 
So long negotiation, long negotiation start with the, with the entrepreneur. And at the end, uh, a deal in this negotiation, Enel again, the entrepreneur stalls again or try to get more. So Enel again decide to be aggressive and does an equity swap for, uh, for, an remaining, for a remaining 14% or 14 99% of the capital, which is the maximum permitted under Spanish regulation. And he tells the entrepreneur, says, see, we are here to stay. We now own 25% of the company. You won't get, we own more than you do. You will not get rid of us. At the same time, they show Eon that they own 25%, and so that they are possibly in a position to block the takeover. So this is, a bat this is a battle being fought with two fronts. One, the only opportunity to win, Enel rightly decides, is to make a deal with the entrepreneur. Two, at the same time, they have to fight the offer by Eon, which, as you can, as you can see, increases his offer to 40, 40 euros per share. At the same time, Enel has been negotiating with the entrepreneur. Enel has been negotiating with the entrepreneur, and they strike a deal in which 25% is going to be owned directly by Enel, but 51% of the shares are going to be owned by a joint venture company made by Enel and the entrepreneur, who is Akshona, where the entrepreneur is 51%. And the entrepreneur who is scared about being trapped into a situation that is not liquid, also has, also negotiate with Enel a right of put, to put to Enel his own shares for, his own shares in, in, uh, in Endesa for the same price that uh, uh, it has been negotiating, the 41, the 41 euros per share. As you have seen, oh, sorry, I, I moved it. As you have seen, uh, the final, the final battle is won by, is won by Einer. He made a deal with Eon on the other side, in which Eon is going to be sold about 10 billion dollar of asset, 10 billion euros of asset, and so Eon also gets a foothold in the Spanish market. But Endesa stays more or less what it is, and the situation is Enel, Acciona, with Acciona, has a right of put to Enel for the shares that they own. Am I going too fast? No, you're doing fine. I mean, we, you've only got about three or four minutes left. I know, but the rest is, uh, the rest is just the end of it. No. So the situation is that the Endesa Eon folds, and Endesa is now owned by Enel and Axiom. Now, in the meantime, what happens in the what happens in the world? In the world happens that uh, there is a credit crunch, which, in the case of Spain, overlaps with a very severe downturn in construction and real estate. You have, we need to differentiate here between different, between different countries. Uh, you have to think that the reliance on debt and the reliance on construction and real estate in the case of Spain was so high that while in Europe you have an unemployment rate that is below 10%, and in the States you have one that is 10%. In Spain, you have an unemployment rate which is 24%, if well counted. So the whole model of development of the Spanish economy is in doubt or is in crisis because of the severe crisis in construction and real estate. To this, you have to add that most of the companies that have been operating there, including Akshona, the partner of Enel, of Enel, had been buying shares with loans by the Spanish banks. So not only you have the collapse in the prices of the real estate asset, you have also 
the trouble in refinancing the loan that have been the, the uh, money that has been borrowed by the uh, by the part by the construction companies. So, for instance, Enel partner starts running into financial trouble. It starts running into financial troubles that are so big that probably the only security that he can that he can give to the banks for renewing the loan that they have extended to him is the put of the 25% of Endesa that he owns or 25 point something to Enel. And that put, by the way, is at a price that is the price of the bid, which is 41. At the same time, the price of the at the same time, the price of the Endesa shares in the market has gone down to 20 or 25, I don't know, between 20 and 25, but it doesn't mean much. So Enel sees the opportunity to, have, to get control of all of the Endesa shares, approaches the entrepreneur and says, OK, you have that right of put for 2011. Why don't we negotiate a situation in which we will pay you less than 31 euros per share? You will get some assets, and we will get your 25%, we will get your 20, we will get your 25 percent of the shares. So there is, a, there is an extensive negotiation. And Enel ends up buying the 25% of Acciona, dissolving the joint venture, and getting control of 92% of Endesa. However, you can see what this does to Enel. The bid was largely based on that. The purchase, the accelerated purchase of the shares has increased the debt. So now Enel finds itself with 22, $23 billion market cap, equity market cap, and $65 billion debt. So the, the change in uh, the change that the management wanted has occurred. But what happened is that because of the way it has been managed and because of the circumstances, there is a huge load of debt on the company. And it is true that they wanted to have a more risky company with higher, with higher potential of growth. But the investors are not very happy about having, about having invested in a company in which uh, yeah, the, equity to, the debt to equity ratio is 3 to 1, or 3.2 to 1. So Enel thinks that uh, a capital increase in order to minimize a, a dividend reduction and a capital increase. What is the problem? The problem is nothing. Probably there is, there is enough room, we advise them, there is, enough room, uh, there is enough appetite in the market to do a capital increase. But the problem is that uh, the Italian government, directly through the treasury, is owns 32% of Enel. And as you know, these are not Europe, European and American <coughs> governments these days are saddled with a large amount of debt that they will have to repay. So at the level of the Italian government, there is very little appetite for subscribing the rights issue. At the other hand, there is very little appetite for being diluted and make Enel into a truly public company. Because when you own more than 30%, according to Italian law, more or less, you nominate 100% of the board or 90% of the board. So there is the final. The final effort by the management is a, is a negotiation, this time not with the Spanish government, but with the Italian government, in order to try to convince the government to, to let the capital increase go forward and either be diluted or subscribe. And, uh, and this is no concern to the class, but the government eventually gave up and found uh, a way in which they could subscribe to the capital increase without increasing uh, the government deficit of the country. Thanks, Paolo. We look forward to having you back in the state.